we're going to talk a little bit about capitalism. We're going to talk about the underdevelopment of, uh, uh, of, of, American, uh, of American society and a little bit beyond, okay? And so um, let me just kind of get this thing uh, started. Okay. You got okay. One of the things that you want to think about of course, is the inequality that really kind of exists in, in, in the globe today. And I just want to show you, when we think about issues of poverty, I just want to show you the, the kind of gulf between, you know, uh, 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 what, a per, what, what a family eats in, in the Sudan in a week compared to what a family eats in, in Germany in a week. And of course, this is the family in Germany, which of course could be easily any American family, black or white, really. And of course, this is, uh, this is uh, the family in, in the Sudan. You can see very meager uh, 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 supplies to try to get through a week. And there's a reason why, that, why that, that occurs. And partly the reason is because capitalism uh, tends to, in many ways, underdevelop people, right? It underdeveloped nations, it underdeveloped groups. It underdevelops, right? You got to remember, with capitalism, there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. And the question becomes, what do we do with the losers? And I mean, so far, this seems to be the answer, right? Now, I want to so talk about how we, how, how we get gotten to this position, right? I'm going to do a lot of talking about my neighborhood in Baltimore, you know? Uh, my neighborhood in Baltimore is the same neighborhood where we saw the, the riots take place, the disturbance take place uh, uh, over the summer, right? I mean, I, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, Right, those rides took place right outside the, 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 the house that I grew up in, right? And so, uh, you know, uh, and maybe in, in some ways I can help to kind of explain why that's going on, right? But it's, this, it's about creating an underclass in American society, right? What we've seen taking place in American si society is that we've seen, can you guys hear me? Okay, what we've seen take pl place in American society is this brutal and systematic underdevelopment especially of the working poor in, in American society, right? Those working poor tend to fall in several different categories, right? Uh, one of those categories are going to be migrant and agricultural workers, uh, and the, uh, 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 their work tends to be seasonal, often following the harvest, and so, you know, they have to make enough money to last through uh, a bad times. Um, there are also are going to be the urban poor, a group that I'm from, right? I'm from that urban poor, and urban poor, they tend to be domestic workers, uh, domestic servants, uh, 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 service workers, um, or unskilled laborers, right? And so, you know, uh, once again, uh, very often the low, in the lowest economic scale, on the lowest economic scale, right? And then there are going to be immigrant workers and undocumented uh, 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 workers, right? And those, uh, uh, they tend to be both urban and rural, and of course, those who are undocumented uh, usually uh, end up in, in the worst conditions, right? They, they end up with the, uh, you know, uh, 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 with the worst jobs, very often ending up in, with jobs that Americans simply don't want, right? And what we've seen is that we've seen this poverty really existing on the other side of really this most, the most rapid uh, uh, accumulation of capital in the world, right? You know, uh, 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 um, mostly coming about especially after, a, after industrialization, right? You're going to see industrialization is going to play a key role in producing uh, uh, capital. All right. Now, of course, our society is filled with all sorts of paradoxes, right? We are a society where affluence coexists right next to poverty. If you go down to Philadelphia, if you go down to uh, East Falls in Philadelphia, that's where uh, the former governor's from, that's where the mayor has houses. Those are a million dollar houses in that East Fall area of Philadelphia. If you go three blocks up the street across the tracks, you will find abject poverty, right? You'll find the high, well, they just tore down the high rise, but you'll find all these low income housing. You'll find housing that's really, you know, it's not taken care of. You know, the people are renters. You know, uh, um, it's just a, a deplorable situation, right? But they coexist right next to the, one of the most affluent 
uh, 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 neighborhoods in Philadelphia. So you've got that, them coexisting, right? And partly this comes about because state power and corporate power in American society in many ways is a product of the fact that workers are powerless. I mean, workers, when they come up against a huge corporation, there's not a whole lot of power that a worker can, 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 can extend, right? And so income mobility for a few, which of course is the American dream, that notion of income mobility is really on the back of income stasis for many, right? I mean, people in my neighborhood, their incomes are pretty static, right? Pretty static, and they're not really going to get much higher, right? All right, but they work every day, right? Because they are integrated into the system, right? And it's the system exists on this institutional sexism, institutional racism, and institutional poverty. You maximize oppression, and at the same time, you maximize profits. So there is profit in poverty, right? And so you, max, uh, you, you maximize both, right? People are faceless, faceless, but they're not excluded, right? You know, uh, 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 service workers uh, especially, you know, uh, in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, they used to call sleeping car porters, who were porters on trains, trains, you know, major mode of travel during that period. Uh, they used to call all, and, and sleeping car porters was one of the best jobs you could get if you were African American. Well, they called every single sleeping car porter George. Didn't make any difference what their names was. They called them George right? Invisible. They were there, but they were there only to serve. And so their name didn't make any difference. Their face didn't make any difference. The only thing that made any difference was their body and their bodies as servants, right? And so what's going to happen is that the poor gets, work, gets, gets exploited not only as workers, but the poor gets exploited as consumers. And I'll talk about how as consumers a, a little later, right? So, so that they are never equal partners in this social contract that we call America, right? And rather than developing poor neighborhoods, our society, our system underdevelops, takes money out of poor neighborhoods, right? And we have this collective discrimination, that institutional sexism, that institutional racism, and institutional poverty. We have that, and, and of course, that collective demonstration, I mean, dis discrimination is going to be enforced, has traditionally been enforced by fear, intimidation, and violence. Fear, intimidation, and violence, they deserve what they get, right? There are 700 million people, or 7 million people, not 700, but 7 million people in jail today, right? Coincidence, a good deal of them are black. Coincidence, I'm not sure. Perhaps another way of violence, another way of intimidation, right? We've seen all this take place with this Senator West, right? And of course, the West has had this drive to control not only the, the world's natural resources, but also the world's human resources as well, right? We've seen that taking place in this drive to control, right? Control nature, control people, right? And we've seen with this, we've seen this capital accumulation taking place from all sorts of inequalities, from all sorts of exploitations. That capital accumulation comes from colonies. Sub colonies only exist through conquering people. They come from piracy, you know, the English and, of course, American Hollywood would suggest that they are Seahawks, that they are privateers, that they are swashbucklers. That's what American movies, English propaganda would have you. The Spanish consider them nothing more than murderers and pirates. They illegally sunk shipping in the lanes, but we make heroes out of them in our movies, on television, 
right? Slave trade, slave trade, 10 and a half million Africans do labor in American society, North and South. Right? Slave trade, tremendous amount of money. You could buy a slave, you could triple your money. You buy a slave in Africa for $1, you sell that same slave in America for $3. You tripled your money. Lucrative, right? And of course, the drug trade. The drug trade. England, opium wars, they forced China to take drugs, to take opium. They accumulate capital, forcing China to take opium. China did the same thing the Americans did. The Americans threw the tea into the harbor, the Chinese threw the opium into the harbor, gave the British an excuse to wage war and forced them to take that opium, right? So that the domestic development in nations are very much tied to the control of foreign markets and people, right? Sugar is a perfect example. Sugar is a perfect example. The slave trade, much of the slave trade revolves around feeding the working class sweet tooth of European society. We don't need sugar. Think about it. Think about the goods that are used for slavery. We use, I mean, uh, that slaves produce. Sugar, we don't need that. Tobacco, we don't need that. Uh, 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 tea, we don't need that. By the way, and coffee, all of which, by the way, are stimulants none of which we really need. Slave trade, uh, uh, indigo, the color blue. You got slaves growing indigo to make blue, you know? And so you control those markets. It's the European sweet tooth that helps to feed into the slave trade. And so you underdevelop labor and you underdevelop industries overseas. You conquer a people and you own, your only concern is to extract raw materials from those people, right? The only industry you set up is industry to extract goods, right? You, 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 you create a tanning industry to tan hides so that you can ship them back to the industrial nation, right? And so you underdevelop. You only create an infrastructure for extraction. You don't create an infrastructure for for people, for interaction, so that every road leads directly from the town to the shore, from the town to the shore, from the town to the shore, never linking the towns. They don't care about linking the towns, don't care about interaction, only care about getting materials out. And so they undeveloped development. And at the same time, they create economic and cultural chaos. It's chaos for people from overseas. It's chaos for people in American society, right? It becomes this economic and cultural chaos. Uh, uh, by the way, can, any, can anybody tell that I'm giving a very left-leaning lecture? Did you, did you notice that? Well, I'm not, <laughs> okay? This is very down the middle, right? And of course, you get economic amnesia. I ask my class, I say to my class, I say, who won the American Revolution? They say, we won the American Revolution. I say, who owns slaves? They said, they own slaves. I get confused. Because the same we who won the American Revolution own slaves. So, but we get amnesia. We forget about that. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to know. We rather not know. Why should we talk about it all the time in my class? Hey, why are you bringing that up? Because it happened. Because it happened. I say that Thomas Jefferson owned 200 slaves. They look at me and they say, why am I dogging out Thomas Jefferson? He owned 200 slaves. That's not dogging them out. That's telling the fact. He owned 200 slaves, right? That's not dogging them out. That's a fact, right? Amnesia, which is no accident. Don't want to know. Don't want to remember, right? In Texas right now, they to Texas, they teach African, they teach slavery. All they teach of slavery is African-American culture. That's all they teach. 
African Americans were able to create a viable culture with slavery, which is absolutely true. But if that's all you ever teach, then slavery ain't all that bad. If you don't show the brutality and the restrictiveness of slavery at the same time showing African American agency, then you're doing a disservice. You're, you're showing a false picture, right? No accident. Of course, there are several dynamics of that degradation, you know, economic inequality, plain and simple. The urban poor, my peeps, that's where I'm from, the urban poor, right? Tended to be domestic servants, right? Housekeepers, cooks, servants, right? Service industry, clerks and hotel workers. My mother worked right next to Johns Hopkins University from the 1950s to the 1980s. She worked there, 1950s to the 1980s. She worked at the lunch counter. She cooked at first, originally she was a cook there, right? Could not eat in the place where she cooked. Could not eat in that lunch counter, right? From all throughout the 50s, all throughout the early 60s. Could not eat in that counter, right? Cloaked, hotel rooms, daycare. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you, there are a lot of resentful, there are a lot of resentful black people in American society. There are a lot of them, okay? And when your parents and your grandparents get old, you give them to nursing homes. You put them in nursing homes. And guess who works in those nursing homes? Guess. A lot of resentful people. Home care, daycare, right? Manual labor, you know, I mean, it's lots of manual labor, right? Unskilled industrial jobs, you know, uh, 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 chicken factories, garment and food preparation, all sorts of things, right? Minimum wage, minimum wage, uh, I believe right now, minimum wage is about, about $18,000, somewhere around there. I'm not sure exactly. It's about $18,000 a year. You can't live in American society, or it's difficult to live in American society off of $18,000, right? Less pay for identical jobs, right? Under the board economy, under the board, right? Under the board. My grandfather, my grandfather, American society would say my grandfather never worked. My grandfather never had a job. Never had a job. Never picked up a paycheck in his life. Raised a family of six. Never had a paycheck in his life. He actually lived in an area in Baltimore, I mean, worked in an area in Baltimore that was, wasn't unlike Villanova, uh, the area here, right? He would, he would leave there in the city where he lived. He, he'd come out here. He cut people's grass, cut people's lawns, right? In many ways, he was a landscaper. He, had, he kept his tools out here in a little shed. He would catch the bus every day, come out here, and cut people's lawns, right? Always got paid under the table. Never got workman's comp. Never got sick pay. Never got, uh, 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 never got, uh, 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 um, you know, <laughs> well, he, he never got Social Security. Never got any of those kinds of things, right? If he, and you got to think his work is seasonal, so he had to save enough money each year to get him through the winter, right? And American society would look at him and they would say, he doesn't work, right? Hidden economy. Take drugs out of my neighborhood. What you're going to replace it with? What are you going to replace it with? Jobs? They talk about job creators. They're not in my neighborhood. I don't know where they are. Take drugs out of the neighborhood, what are you going to replace it with? You see drug dealers, you see them flashing money around. You see them all the time with guns and money. You see them on the internet, you see them on television. And that's your picture. You don't see that money paying for the rent. You don't see that money paying for gas and electric. All you see that money doing is flashing. 
You know, take drugs out of the neighborhood, what are you going to replace it with? Right? Hidden uh, economy, under the board. Right? They asked me, they said, they said, they always come up with crazy things, right? When I first got here, right, they looked at me and they said, they said, Larry, how come you were able to get out of the neighborhood and wasn't nobody else able to get out? Other people weren't. And when I first got here, I, I, I said to myself, gee, that's a really good question, <laughs> right? How come I, what, I was able to do that, right? <laughs> you know? And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought everybody in my neighborhood worked. Everybody might not have a job, everybody might not have a paycheck, but everybody works. And everybody grabs at that brass ring. Everybody. Every day. Grab at it, right? I grabbed at it every day. It just happened that one day I grabbed at it and it was in my hand. At any point in time, at any point in time, I could have gotten a car and my whole life would be different. At any point in time. Hidden. Economy. Don't want to pay taxes on that work, on my grandfather's work. Would rather pay him under the table. No sick leave for him. Right? Little manufacturing. This is another thing they used to tell me when I first got here, right? They used to say, they say, Larry. That's my name, by the way. Larry. They say, Larry, how come, how come Polish people lived in your neighborhood and they got out? Italians lived in your neighborhood, and they got out. Jewish people lived in your neighborhood, and they got out. How come you can't get out? I said, geez, really a good question, <laughs> right? How come we can't get out, <laughs> you know? Then I thought about it, right? And then I looked at my neighborhood when Jewish people and Polish people and Italian people lived in it, right? When I first moved into that neighborhood or born into it, I didn't move into it, born into it, right? When I first realized the neighborhood, they used to have Gibbs Pork and Beans, a big factory. Gibbs Pork and Beans is punch ketchup now, right? They used to have uh, a giant bakery, right? That, you know, that, that e e eventually uh, uh, a Tasty Cake brought up, right? They used to have this giant laundry. Back then, everybody used to send their wash out before washing machines and laundromats, right? And they had that there, right? Revlon had a huge factory there, right, in my neighborhood, right? They had Beta Bullets. You guys know Beta Bullets? Beta Bullets is Converse now, Converse shoes. Beta Bullets, they used to make them in my neighborhood, right? Beta Bullets went from my neighborhood in the middle of Baltimore to Baltimore County, from Baltimore County to Mexico, from Mexico to the Philippines, from Philippines to Korea, all in search of one thing, cheap labor. If you want $100, Converses, you can't produce them in my neighborhood. Labor costs are going to be too high, which would drive out the price of those cheap Converses. Empty shelves, though. The problem is, is that all those buildings that I just talked about, they're still there. They're empty. They're empty shelves, rat-infested, burnt-out shelves of buildings that remind people of why Jewish people got out. Italian people got out, Polish people got out, right? And if you go down to Philadelphia along the Hunting Park area, you'll see the exact same thing. You'll see the exact same thing. Little manufacturing, empty shelves, right? What else we got here? Lack of benefits. Like I said, my grandfather never got any benefits, right? Lack of benefits, high unemployment, high debt, right? Inadequate transportation. Inadequate transportation. Think about it. When that beta bullet moved from Baltimore City to Baltimore County, think about how many people couldn't afford to go. Of course, once they moved to Mexico, that was out. Right? Right now, there are people who live in West Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, who get on the bus, take that bus to Central Station, get on the R5, ride the R5 all the way out to Paoli, at the end of Paoli, they get off the bus, I mean, get off the train at the last stop. There's a van waiting for them, a company van that's going to take them to their manufacturing job. Think about how much money they spend in transportation every week.
back and forth. And of course, the van charges them as well. Think about how much money it takes every week, right? Housing, you know, in my neighborhood, we live like this. Suburbs, you live like that, right? We live like this. I was born and raised in a house that was designed for one family, one family. When I lived in it, six families lived, six families lived in it, right? First floor, it was three stories. They had first floor front and back, second floor front and back, third floor front and back. We used coal to heat. Once they converted from coal to oil, didn't need so much space in the cellar, and so they put another, a seventh apartment in the cellar, right? A seventh one in the cellar. Now, I don't know for sure, but I'm just guessing that those decades of coal being stored in that basement was not cleaned out adequately to put a, a family in. Don't think so, right? Housing, terrible. Boarding, you know, you have to have borders, right? Inadequate transportation. What else we got here? Uh, 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 uh. Profits and poor, right? Racial animosity and competition. You know, black people in competition with white people for jobs, right? And of course, employers use that, you know, use those notions, right? I wish I had a blackboard. They didn't give me a room with a blackboard in it. That's terrible. That's okay. Racial animosity, I deal a lot with that. You can imagine. Higher profits from labor. You can pay the poor less. Not only from labor, but from consumption as well. That one, if, you, if you watch Baltimore over the summer, you know that there's a black mall that rises. They didn't really do a whole lot of damage to it, right? But it was in the news, right? Called Ma and Darman. It's a black mall, right? Basically, predominantly black people go to it, right? It has pretty much, except for a high end store, it doesn't have the high end stores, right? But it has the mi middle end and the low end stores that all the, all the uh, 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 malls have, right? So it has all the same stores that all the malls have, right? In Tom McGann's, the shoe store. In Tom McGann's, a, shoe, a pair of shoes in Tom McGann's at Ma and Darman cost $34. 95. That same pair of shoes in Tom McGann's in King of Prussia cost $29.95. Why? Because those people who live in my neighborhood live around Mondaman. That's the only place they can get to. Some of them have to catch the bus to get to Mondaman, right? And Mondaman knows that. The Tom McGann's in Mondaman knows that. But they also know that if you can get to King of Prussia, you can get the Plymouth Meeting, you can get the Springfield, you can get the Granite Run, you can get to all those different malls that are right along that quarter, right, and there's a whole bunch of them, right, and they are in competition with one another, and so they have to sell their shoe for $29.95 because they're in competition with one another. No competition in Baltimore in that poor neighborhood, and so they sell the shoe for $34.95. Now, I'm talking about shoes. Think about the grocery store. The exact same thing, exact same thing, higher prices. There's a little store in the corner of my neighborhood, right, that people have to go to that you, a, a, a small can, a small can of vegetables will cost $1.50, a small can, whereas a can twice as large costs, you know, <laughs> and, and, and supermarkets around in, you know, in the suburbs, small can, 77 cent. I mean, a large can, 77 cent, like that. Lack of transportation means lack of be being able to get any place, right? And they know that, and so there's profit from labor, right, from consumption. And that's the heart and soul of underdevelopment. I can pay them more, I can charge them. I mean, I can pay them less, I can charge them more. That becomes a way of making money. Right? Failed policies and programs on both sides, right and left. You know, right and left. Failed policies, economic policies. I mean, they had uh, 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 Nixon. Yeah, Nixon came into my neighborhood, right? He would, they were going to create these enterprise zones. 
right, where there were going to be all these businesses that were going to create jobs. They created the enterprise zone. Only two businesses, two large businesses, a couple little temporary businesses came in there, right, but only two large businesses ever used that enterprise zone, and one of those businesses was already in the neighborhood. They just simply moved, right, and so never happened. You know, failed policies and programs on both sides, left and right. Hey, that's, wait a minute, hold it. There is a dynamic to this, uh, to this dependency, right? And of course, that dynamic comes about because of this political and social inequality, right? I didn't want to get ahead of myself. I wanted to make sure you see this political inequality, right? Okay? Because much of that is about maintaining a social class, right? Limited political influence, right? I go to the American Legion in my community, right? I got tired to say a neighborhood, say community for a little while, right? I went, uh, we got an American Legion. They say, Democrats, Republicans, it really doesn't make a difference. Policies don't change doesn't really change. They just argue back and forth with one another. But it's not doesn't make any difference. We high, we had we we elected a black mayor. Right? We elected a black mayor. First black mayor in the history of Baltimore. We elected it. Oh happy day. Everybody was happy. Oh happy day. He was mayor for 12 years. Right? Everybody who was poor before he became mayor was poor after he left office. Didn't make a difference. Didn't make any difference at all. As a matter of fact, we really think that because we had a black mayor, we lost jobs from Baltimore, right? Didn't make a difference. Politics didn't make a difference. Don't vote, not allowed to vote. Voter suppression laws, which by the way, hit you guys as well. The new voter suppression laws. They're not allowed to vote. It's about blocking voting. It's about blocking voting, right? Using, you know, none of this stuff is new. Using extra legal methods of blocking people from voting, especially African Americans, is not new. It's not new. It's been done all. They had poll taxes. They had literacy tests. They had a, 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 a a uh, 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 grandfather clause, right? The grandfather clause said that if, if you didn't vote, if your grandfather didn't vote in the 1867 election, then you couldn't vote, right? Now, of course, the problem with that is that slavery is only over, in, is over in 1865. No black person that wasn't already free voted in the 1867 election. Extra Legal. Now, what did they say? You got to have an ID card, right? But then the place where you get the ID card only opens up once every month for four hours. And so how do you get an ID card if you can't go to the place where, you, where, where it opens up? All sorts of ways that's not allowed, right? No independent capital base. You know, the difference between me and my neighbor is I have income, he has wealth. It is. He lost his job, right? My neighbor lost his job, right? He's sitting on the porch drinking lemonade. I lose my job, I'm going to McDonald's, <laughs> right? I'm filling out an application, right? Because I already know I'm not going to be able to make it, right? No independent capital base, not for individuals, not for the community. In a Jewish neighborhood, Jewish neighborhood, Italian neighborhood, Korean neighborhood. The dollar goes around five or six times. Goes around five or six times, right? It goes from the Jewish baker to the Jewish butcher to the Jewish cleaners to what have you. About five or six times. Same thing in Italian. Same thing in Korean neighborhood. Go from one to one to one so that one dollar, that one dollar, six people get to use that one dollar. In my neighborhood, it comes in, it goes right back out. Doesn't circulate. Comes in, goes back out. Does not circulate at all. 
right? Doesn't say to it, right? What are you going to replace drugs with? Nobody answered me. Take it out. How are you going to supplement that income? Drugs are bad. Drugs are illegal. Yes, of course they are. Drugs are a multi-million dollar business in my community. What are you going to replace it with? Or once again, let them not pay their rent, let them not eat, let them eating. You know, it's another thing that I just have to do this, Chad. Because another thing that I used to get is that they say, hey, this poor person, he's sitting up there with a big screen television and cable, a hundred dollar cable bill a month. You used to tell me about that all the time, right? Say, look at him, sitting on welfare with a hundred dollar cable bill a month. Right? I said, geez, that does sound kind of bad. Right? But then when I thought about it, right? When I thought about it, you, you go to the movies, you go to the restaurant, you go to the play, you go to this for entertainment, you go to that for entertainment, you go, you spend three, four hundred dollars a month in entertaining yourself. And then you get on those people for spending a hundred dollars to look at cable. At least when they're looking at cable, they're not in, out in the street, right? No independent capital, right? Lack of leadership and organization. I, I play a game with my class, right? I, I, I choose, I, get, I, I point out the black students, by the way. You know, if you're a black student at Villanova, they tell me that black students, when any time a black issue comes up, the first thing the professor does is turn to the black student. and says, well, what do black people think? I got what you should do. Don't have a problem with that. If you're a black student at Villanova, don't have a problem with that. Just tell the professor, I'm glad you called on me because I can speak on behalf of 40 million black people. Just tell them that. Say, I know exactly what 40 million black people think, and I'm going to tell you exactly what they think. So that, just tell them that, and you'll be okay, right? So this is what I do to the students. I, I go to the black student, you know, and I say, I say to the black student, I said, is Jesse Jackson your leader? <laughs> and they look at me like I'm dumb. <laughs> I say, is Al Sharpton your leader? <laughs> they look like I'm even more dumb, right? But what, who does the media go to if something happens? They go to Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. Why? Because our media is lazy. They know that they can go to Jesse or Al and get that 30 second sound bite. That's all they need. No justice, no peace. We, let's move on. That's all they need. That 30 second sound bite. No analysis, no consideration, no, you know, <laughs> just that's all they want is a 30 second sound bite. And so that becomes our leadership. That becomes black America's leadership. Because why? Because MSN tells us. Because Fox tells us, get real, right? Assumptions of intellectual and cultural inf inferiority. Lots of that, you know, it's still out there, still out there. I did, you know, anyway, right? Popular culture, all the, you know, aesthetics in American society, it all reinforces all that, right? I play this game with my class, right? I tell my class, I say, let's. Let's sit up and let's name the black comedies that are on television, right? And they, we make a game out of it, right? They start with good times and they end with blackish. And they got this one and that one and this one and that one. They try to outdo each other coming up with them, you know, you know going back and forth, 80 shows, 90 shows, comedy after comedy after comedy. They make a game out of it. Then once they've kind of got exhausted naming all of them, I look at them and say, okay, now name the black dramas. Silence. Silence. So black people in entertainment are only good for laughing at. How, nothing wrong with black comedies, but if it's the only thing you see, then that becomes your only perception. And it reinforces those stereotypes and images. Just reinforces those. 
I I'm teaching this course on, let me see what com what com what's coming up, okay? It may be come up a little in a second, right? But I'm teaching it, I taught this course on racism in the Americas, right? Last semester, or, no, no, I mean, or, or exporting global racism, right? So I'm looking at racism around the globe, right? And so I'm looking at these plant, I'm looking at these plantation stereotypes like Sambo and Mammy and Buck, a bunch of plantation stereotypes, right? So I'm saying to myself, well, I wonder if there are any of these plantation stereotypes attributed to, or you know, placed on Obama, right? And so I said, so I, so I went on and I, I looked up Obama Google search, right? Google image search, because I'm looking for images, right? So I looked up Obama and racial stereotypes. Whatever you do, don't look up Obama and racial stereotypes on Google. You will get absolutely picture after picture of the most racist depictions that you can imagine, right? I, I got, it got so that I said, well, wait a minute, hold it. <laughs> maybe, maybe, the, uh, maybe I'm just not being fair. I said, let me, let me do George Bush and racial stereotypes. So I did George Bush and racial stereotypes. All I got was Bush in a cowboy hat. That was it. Last Democrat, last Republican national convention, they were selling Obama waffles with Obama in an Angel Mama outfit, selling it at the convention. The President of the United States at the convention. Right? Education system has always been a joke. The dropout rate in my neighborhood has improved. It used to be 80% for black males. It used to be 80%, right? Now it's 70%, so it's better, right? It's gotten better in the last five or six years, right? 70% of the black males in my neighborhood don't graduate from high school. What are they going to do in life? I can tell you what they're not going to do. They're not going to starve. I can tell you that. And if it means busting you upside your head so that they won't starve, all I can tell you is they're not going to starve. Right? Education system has always been a joke. They get, talk about jokes. This is a joke that they tell at the American Legion, right? They say, they say, they took, uh, 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 they took art out of the schools. They took music out of the schools. They took athletics out of the schools. They took God out of the schools. They took discipline out of the schools. And then they took their children out of the schools and they left us the rest. They left us the rest. Schools are more segregated today, in 2015, 2016, more segregated today than they were in 1970. More segregated, right? Public school, if you're white, you only go to public school if you live in the county. Other than that, you go to private school. Literate and cheap labor force. Tradition of denial, right? Dependent on a cycle of poverty, debt, crime, debt. Talk about debt. If you're poor, they charge you more interest. It doesn't matter if you've never defaulted. They just charge you more interest. Why? Because you're poor. Once again, profit and poverty, right? So they don't make any difference, you know, if you've never defaulted on a loan, if you've always been on time, none of that makes any difference. You just get a higher interest rate because you're poor, plain and simple, right? Crime, drugs. I live my neighborhood, The Wire. Anybody, you guys familiar with The Wire? Comes on HBO, used to come on HBO, talks about drugs and everything. Terrible show. I mean, critically acclaimed. It's just so full of bull, right? Critically acclaimed. Looking at my neighborhood, it makes my neighborhood look like it's a bunch of drug dealers, a bunch of drug, drug dealers and criminals. Doesn't show the working class people who work there every single day. It just shows that 6%. That's what it focuses on. 
It focuses on the 6%, but it makes that 6% look like everybody. This is what they did. They came to Wire. They spoke about drugs, right? They came to the neighborhood, and they wanted authenticity. That's what they wanted. They wanted authenticity. So they went out, and they hired a bunch of junkies to be in the background, to be, you know, in the background, so that they could have authenticity, right? Now, let me tell you something. When you pay a junkie, what do you think he's going to do with the money? I mean, what? What do you think? Junkie, money. And so here's a show, show about showing the evils of drugs that's feeding the drug habits of people in the community, right? And of course, it all ends up in death, right? So there's global implications. I'm not going to all, all that. How are we looking? We're looking good? All right. Ah, destroy local man. Just forget all that. Ah, forget all that. Forget all that, too. That's, that's some more of that. That's some more of that, 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 that socialist stuff, you know? that left-leaning stuff, right? You know, that, did I tell you that this is a left-leaning lecture? I did tell you all that. It's not quite a Marxist lecture. Not quite. <laughs> okay, pretty close. Not quite. Uh, uh, I gotta say one thing about the left. For me, the left does a real good job of looking at the problem. I ain't so sure about fixing the problem, they do a good job of looking at the problem. So that's all I'm doing, is looking at the problem, right? That's overseas. Lots of stuff, crazy stuff overseas, right? Hey, uh, uh, pirates. We, we, you saw the Sudan, right? Pirates, Somali pirates, right? Big deal a couple years ago, big deal, right? Somali pirates jumping on cruise, I mean, not cruise ship, jumping on oil tankers, grabbing people, Americans hostage. They made a... Didn't they make a movie out of it with Tom Hanks and stuff? Yeah, they made a movie. I should, have, I should see the movie, because I want to know if they tell, tell the whole story in the movie. The whole story, right? Because Americans never get the whole story. All we ever get is the end. Right? We don't get the whole story. Those Somalia pirates were fishermen. That's what they did for a living. They were fishermen off the waters of Somalia. That's fishing villages. That's where they come from. Centuries of villagers making a living off of fishing off the coast of Somalia. Then one day, oil tankers decided, hey, this is a good route to go. This is a faster route to go. And so forget those fishing lanes, forget those areas. We're going to make shipping lanes out of those fishing areas. And so, and not only that, but since Somalia doesn't have a good government, we're going to just take all our trash and we're going to dump it right here. As soon as we get to Somalian waters, we'll dump it, all the trash, all the waste. We'll dump it all out, right? And so those people who used to make a living off the sea, they no longer can make the same living because oil tankers have chased all the fish away. And so who are you upset at? The oil tankers. And so who do you attack? The oil tankers, right? Anyway, it's defining the debate, globalization, that's it. The big trade-off, that's capitalism, right? Capitalism is the big trade-off, you know? You got winners, you got losers. Never can tell me what to do with the losers, right? What is globalization, right? It's the movement of capital and goods and ideas people across national boundaries, right? When we think about it, across these national boundaries, right? Okay? We get this creation of this integrated world market of which my neighborhood is a part of. You gotta think that they are a part of this integrated world market. We all are a part of this integrated world market. We all want cheap goods, right? You want the cheapest iPhone, you want the newest, you want the cheapest, right? We're all integrated in this cheap market, right? 
Globalization has promised. Globalization is the promise of economic prosperity. There's the promise of democratic ideals spreading across the globe, right? We saw Arab Spring. We saw Iranians have a spring. You know, the outcome may have not been as good as we wanted to, but we did see people rising up against repressive regimes, right? With the idea of spreading, you know, spreading democracy, right? But there are a lot of the people who say that those are nothing more than old enemies in new disguises, that globalization is nothing more than people who are in the best position taking advantage of people who are in the worst position, underdeveloping. American society in the globe, underdeveloping, taking people and creating poverty, right? But poverty is what? It's inherited? Or is it created? What makes people poor? I mean, really, what makes people poor? People who are rich. That's what makes people poor, people who are rich, right? And so we see this persistence of poverty, exploitation, and equality. And in Haiti, they got children making baseballs for 36 cents per baseball. 36 cents per base baseball. That's how much we pay those children in Haiti to make those baseballs. We sell them in American society for $19.99. We pay them 36 cents. We sell them here for $19.99. Exploitation? I don't know. They tell me, hey, if they didn't have that job, they wouldn't have no job. Hey, so what if we give them substandard baby formula? If they didn't have that baby formula, they wouldn't have no baby formula. Good excuse, right? What we see, of course, is the denial of human rights. 70% dropout rate for black males in my neighborhood is a human rights issue. It is, it absolutely is. I looked on the schedule for today I saw there's at least three sessions on mass incarceration. Three sessions. We went from incarcerating 700,000 people in 1970 to 7 million people in 2016. Our population hasn't risen by 10 times, but our prison population has. Especially in 1970, they were talking about getting rid of prisons. Talking about, hey, what do we really need them for? That's what they were talking about in 1970, both right and left. That's what they were talking about, right, until we got a war on drugs, right? So, future, right? Future, right? What we need to do, because I got, I got answers, right? What can we do about it? What can one person do? Anything they want. One person can do anything they want. They can start a movement. What can one person do? Anything they want. Realistic program, abolish underdevelopment and lessen poverty. Let me tell you, when I first got here, when I first got here to Villanova, I had all sorts of problems with the priest here about poverty. They told me that the poor will always be among us. I said, what? What do you mean? They said the poor will always be among us. He said, it's in the Bible. Jesus said it. I said, Jesus was wrong. <laughs> they really got mad at me. <laughs> they really did. <laughs> they got real mad at me, right? Hey, why does the poor have to always be among us? I don't understand that line of thought. I don't understand it. So the poor will always be among us so I can have a golden goblet to drink wine out of because the poor will always be among us. Less than poverty, we can do it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to retire next year so I can talk about priests all I want. It's okay. When I first got here, you know the picture of St. Augustine in, in, in Augustine Center? 
you know, in, 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 in St. Augustine, right? When I first, it, it, it first opened up, right? Now, in my very, 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 very Roman Catholic church, there's only two white people, God and the priest. That's all, <laughs> the only white people in the church, right? Uh, I just, I was, always wished that one of those little angels right there, if they could be black, they couldn't hurt anything, right? So they were the, <laughs> they were the only uh, 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 black people in my church, right? St. Augustine, there were images of St. Augustine. Every image in, of St. Augustine in my church was of a black person. So I grew up looking at a black St. Augustine. So when I walked into St. Augustine Center, I said, who is that? They said it was St. Augustine. I said, no, it's not. They said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. They said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. They said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> right? So I got kind of tired of arguing with them. Right? <laughs> and so I said, so I no longer say that St. Augustine was a black guy, right? But what I do say to him is, well, he was born and raised in a place called Hippo in Africa, and his mother was a heathen, and although he might not have been black, I'm almost sure he don't look like nothing like that 13th century Italian you got on your wall right there, <laughs> right? Anyway, we need to realign and reinvent capitalism. Right? Realign and re e event capitalism. That's right. I'm going to read the next line. I'm going to say the next line real loud. Right? I'm going to read it. I got to get my microphone thingy. I'm going to hold it. I'm getting it. Where is it? They got me wired. Ain't that something? Okay. All right. I got it. Right? We need a more equitable distribution of wealth. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I said it. More equitable distribution of wealth. Come on. I'll take you on one at a time or as a group. It don't make no difference to me. Okay. I said it. I meant it, and I ain't taking it back. Right? Right? Beginning points. Health care. Why should you get better health care? Because you got money. Why? Somebody answer me because the rich should get better, right? Why should you get better health care? Obamacare, please, get real. Obamacare is nothing. That's nothing. Single payer. That's where it's at. Education. They tell me, you don't want an equal education. You go to Villanova for a better education. I don't even know why Villanova should exist. I did tell y'all I'm... I'm, I'm <laughs> Another year, right? I don't even know why Villanova exists. Why? How much does it cost? Fifty-five thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars to go to Villanova. It costs six thousand dollars to go to Coppin State. If I taught at Coppin State College, I would not change a single word I teach. I don't know what you're getting for your sixty thousand dollars. It ain't me. <laughs> okay, it ain't me, right? Education. And justice system. You get better justice. We don't, our justice system doesn't care about guilt or innocence. It only cares about winning and losing. Guilt and innocence doesn't matter. Winning and losing is what matters, right? I had a, one of you, I had a student one year who, uh, who went to court, right? She, had a, she was a witness in a trial, and she spent all day in the courtroom, right? So she comes back and she says, to the class, she said, she said, Professor Little, look, she said, it didn't, make, it didn't make any difference if you were black, white, Latino. He said, it didn't make any difference. If you didn't have a lawyer, if you had a public defender, you went to jail, plain and simple. If you had your own lawyer, then your case got postponed or it got thrown out. But if you had a public defender, you went to jail. Didn't make any difference if you were guilty. You went to jail. Didn't make any difference. Right? So here's the ultimate question for us Catholic social thought people. You know, that's what we are, Catholic social thought. Right? Catholic social thought. I should, I should, I should be teaching that. But anyway, Catholic social thought. Forget Marx. Forget Lenin. 
Go straight to the Pope. Go to Francis. See what Francis says. That's all you have to do. You don't have to listen to Lenin. You don't have to listen to Marx. You don't have to listen to me. Listen to Francis. I mean, Pope Francis. Right? Respect. Pope Francis. Listen to Pope Leo. Listen to Pope John Paul. Listen to John II. Listen to them. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to listen to Marx. You don't have to listen to any of that socialist stuff. None of it. Listen to the Pope. That's all. Listen to the Pope. Is the right to work and receive wages that contribute to an adequate standard of living a basic human right? It's up to you to answer, not me. Okay? <laughs>